Hello and welcome. Daryl Hannah's movie career started slowly but took off in the 1980s with roles in Blade Runner, Summer Lovers, then Splash and later Roxanne, Legal Eagles and Wall Street, among others. But in 1985, she tackled what would be one of her most physically challenging roles as a Cro-Magnon woman in The Clan of the Cave Bear. The film was shot in spectacular prehistoric settings in the Yukon and Cathedral Provincial Park in British Columbia, Canada. Now, the movie is based on Jean M. Ayer's acclaimed book of the same name, exploring the primeval interactions between emerging mankind. And, as Daryl explained to me in an interview in Los Angeles, shortly after shooting the film, as well as the challenging weather conditions and other logistical nightmares, there was the tricky matter of translating the dialogue for actors playing Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon characters. I understand physically it was a pretty uh, tough shoot up in Vancouver. Yeah, it was actually um, physically about the same, uh, actually maybe a little less strenuous than some of the other films I've done because Splash was really physically very difficult mm. and uh, Blade Runner was physically difficult too. Uh, I think this was more... Uh, mentally difficult you know really? yeah uh, the physical i mean the, the the logistically it was difficult i mean there were helicopters and you know uh, you know to hike and you had to live in a tent and it was there was no warm water to shower in and everything was intense you know that that it was difficult in that respect but to me i don't find that really strenuous physically i i, I think that the that it was more difficult because it was really hard to get the script right because uh, it's such a difficult book to translate into a film, you know, format. And it, it was it's a it's a difficult picture to do because it's not in, in, in any language that can be readily understood, you know, to anybody. So it's it's uh, I think that that's really where it was difficult because. It had its effect on the cast because we had to sort of um, take part in making some of those decisions and figuring out how we were going to walk and move and sound and, you know. Now, all did that. you have, uh, did, as they did with Quest for Fire, did mm. you have specialists come in and work with you on Well, as a matter of fact, um, when once we started shooting, they realized that we were going to need that help. Uh, we, we tried to, to get that organized beforehand, but they didn't think they would need it. And once we started shooting, the, the uh, production team realized that they would they would let us have the, the help that we needed and, and um, they they got the same guy Peter Elliott who worked oh, really? on Quest for Fire and Greystoke he was he played Silverbeard in Greystoke and um, he came and helped us and and he was an enormous help I mean everyone was so relieved to have someone <laughs> yeah. you know tell us what to do because we were just guessing you know I mean there were some actors who were with their hips forward, you know, shoulders back, head down, and there were others who were going like this, and there were, you know, it was, it was all over the How place. How eventually did you walk? I mean, basically, because you walk, you walk slightly different to the, to the yes, family that adopts you. Yes, I pretty it. much walk how I, you know, how, you how, do today. how I do today, except for uh, um, a little, you know, a little bit more flexible, maybe, you know, you can get down and up much easier from the ground, because, mm. you know, there's no, no chairs, so, you know, you squat, and that, that kind of thing, but... Actually, in the cast, they walk they walk a little bit differently. Just you know, like in those evolution pictures, it's probably the step right before you know <laughs> where the it's a little bit hunched over and a yeah. little bit you know. So how did how forward. did you go, how did you go learning a script that you know was dialogue of a sort, but but not dialogue like uh, we know. Well, see, we never really had a final script, so I didn't really have to learn it. We was so, sort of. Like a lot of scripts, actually, you get new pages every day, mm. you know, and, and this script in particular, because when I went there, the, the script was in English, you know, and once we were there, we were there for about a month before shooting uh, to prepare and rehearse or try to get the script into shape, and there was really, we couldn't really rehearse because the script wasn't ready yet, and so we would just sort of practice it, movements and stuff. So, so initially, the, the script that you had had just conventional lines. It just had like, yeah, conventional lines. So how did they tr turn it around to? I mean, who, did did you invent your own sounds? Or? Yeah, we invented sounds. We had a man um, 
named Lou Fant who came and helped us with sign language uh, eventually and he helped us create a sign language that was based on a ASL which is American Sign Language uh, but like maybe a prehistoric version of mm. ASL you know and slightly slower so person. and actually something that you can almost you can almost uh, understand even mm. if you didn't know sign language you know it's like for example drink you know mm. right uh, meat because you rip it off your teeth you know and then like let's say if this is drink this means full this means empty you know right. this this means hun hungry you know scratching mm. your stomach you know this means thirsty you know that this means uh, wait what was it hot means this you know it's like you know it burns to right. touch uh, there's you know so basically all of this, we had about 365 words or maybe a few more, I mean quite a large vocabulary and adjectives and nouns and all sorts of things, but... Uh, so in the sign language. In sign language, and then we were going to do it just in sign language and then we shot a couple of days like that and they realized that didn't work and they wanted some sound and so we had to create sounds to go with some of the signs, so it's like Italian reversed, you know. <laughs> Where Italian is like, you know, da 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 da, and they make gestures with their hands. We sort of speak with our hands and gesture with our sounds, you know, right, sort of right. accentuate. It, it seems, though, that it was a, an ill prepared film from the, from the outset. I mean, that they didn't really have a clear idea of how well, they should go about it. I'm not sure it was ill prepared. It was just, it's a tough one to prepare, you know, it's mm. a really tough one. I think they wanted to, to make the film, you know, they wanted to. Uh, they, you know, they knew that the book was real popular, and they, they figured it would make a good film. And I still do. I think it, it, it's a, it could, you know, the story, quite possibly, could be a very good film, and it still may be a very good film. I mean, I haven't even seen it yet, so who knows? It mm. might be mm. very good. But, but it just strikes me though that, that, that something like that, yeah, um, and particularly it takes a lot of preparation. Well, well, not, yes, preparation, but preparation that somebody else should be doing. That the, yeah. the, the, the writers should have researched it, and, and the producers well, they, should have figured that they did need people. Well, they went through a couple of writers, and and they actually, you know. They got around to it eventually. I don't think anyone knew it was going to be so difficult. Mm. You know, I don't think anybody had the, the vaguest idea of how actually hard it was. Plus, they had a lot of problems that nobody could control. Like, like well, I mean, here we are in the Yukon, you know, and they've, they're flying everything up in helicopters. The set, they built a huge cave and flew it to this location, which was like, you know, hundreds of miles from Vancouver. the nearest. Yeah hundreds of miles from the nearest uh, semblance of a town, hundreds of miles from the nearest payphone, you know. <laughs> and um, they built a, a, a location and they put up tents and they flew the entire crew, the entire cast, which is a very large cast because you don't just need one or two people, you know, mm. like most things, you know, where, you, you know, there's a lot of people in maybe one scene but only two and, you know, it, you always need everybody because it's the clan, you know. And yeah. So they had to take the entire cast plus, you know, uh, everybody else it takes to make a film. And then uh, we get up there and there, there'd be fog for weeks, and so you might as well have been in the back lot of Burbank because the weather, you know. Or, or there was one time when we could. It was summer, I presume, though, wasn't it? This was, was in shooting. the summer. Yeah, they picked the right time of the year, but it just so happened Mother Nature, you know, gave us bad weather, and and um, there was one time when we were stuck for three three days or something um, in a town because half of the cast got to the set and then it fogged in and they couldn't safely fly anybody else in. Half of the cast was still in some town way back where, I don't know where, you know, trying to get a bus because the, la the, the, the pilot who flew us into this town before you had to get on a helicopter and go to the next spot uh, almost crashed into a mountain because the weather was so bad and said he wasn't flying anymore so they were going to have to take a bus which was going to take a whole day and I mean we so we spent the night in, the, in this gym of a mining town for, you know, a couple of nights and I mean you know, it was it was difficult. It was just a log logistical nightmare, is what they call it. You know, uh, they went through a lot of people. Um, why did they film. shoot in the Yukon? I mean, why not somewhere in British Columbia? Um, 
that well they shot in British Columbia also they shot in Penticton and in uh, Vancouver and the, they sometimes they did the interiors and the night stuff they they used all sets because it was just too difficult but, I, I mean, uh, surely but even... the Yukon I mean you can shoot I mean if it's a clear day you know which they were hoping for uh, you can shoot for you know 50 miles or you can shoot as far as the camera can see and not have to paint anything out and mm. unbelievably uh, um, prehistoric looking landscapes things like you've never seen I mean, like things, what sort of things? trees? Or? oh glaciers that were just unreal with these chips turquoise blue chips coming out of them and, and uh, rivers that would wind and you know take off into the sunset you know and you could see them going through this canyon for miles and miles and, and mountains that were very oddly shaped you know and it was really beautiful so and the, spectacular mean, and, and it demanded that sort of and it did, it did. I mean thing. if you yeah I, I think so especially if you have a film that's that's not in English, and, and I mean, it should be visual and prehistoric and everything. It should be visually uh, uh, stimulating. So, mm. so anyway, it was the right. It was the right. <coughs> the right. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the right idea, and just bad luck, you know. Mm. F physically, for you, <coughs> did it take a toll on you? Um. No, I don't think I got very very ill or anything on that. Don't. I think I was okay. There were some times when I was real cold. Same with the rest of the cast. And mm. Got what, really what cold. It hailed one. Hailed. <laughs> hailed so big. They were almost like golf balls, really. It was dangerous to go outside of the tent, you know, because the hail the balls were so big. <laughs> and here it is, summer, you know. <laughs> we're on the top of this mountain. and <laughs> So the, the story basically is what you... It starts with you as a baby. Yeah. I mean, that, obviously not with you, but a, yeah, but a baby right. is your character, right. and then, then you're what? Ha, how are you taken into the other family? Why are you taken in by the other family? Well, read the book. <laughs> no, um, um, it's uh, she's about four years old, and um, is uh, through the earthquake has lost her family and everything, and uh, uh, survives for a couple of days on her own, eating grass and, you know, drinking water out of the stream and uh, basically, you know, just surviving off of her instinct and uh, um, finally, uh, and she's, you know, she's not having a good time with that either and, and uh, finally uh, she, she gets mauled by a lion, which makes a big gash in her leg and takes, you know, a lot of blood and most of her energy away and finally she just collapses and she's on the verge and the brink of death when they find her and um, she the the clan men pass her up thinking oh you know just some dead animal you know it's not not healthy to eat something that's already dead and they just sort of pass her up as a dead little animal and then um, one of the uh, clan women Isa who is the medicine woman of the clan who's pregnant uh, with that maternal feeling that mm. that a pregnant woman has, and also the, the 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 desire to heal that a medicine woman has, finds this little creature and, and recognizes her as one of the others, you know, one of the other type of human being, and which is sort of they ha has a negative connotation amongst the clan members, you know, um, but also recognizes her as an infant, you know, a baby animal of any kind, you know, uh, just. A, an infant and, and uh, an infant, a child, you know, and um, she asked permission to, to, to try to um, heal her and, uh, you know, the guy, uh, the leader of the clan, Brun is his name, he basically doesn't want to pay any attention because he's looking for a new home because they lost their cave in the earthquake too and he's got all these things on his mind and they're lost and, you know, they don't know where they're going. And he doesn't want to think about it. She keeps asking and asking. And finally, he looks at it and thinks, well, it's going to die anyway. It's almost dead. And he says, you know, fine, do whatever you want. Listen, we got it, you know. And he doesn't really think about it. And some of the other people in the clan are kind of grossed out. And they think it's, you know, it's, it's bad luck to take this other in and stuff. But basically, she keeps the child and she does heal it. And, and then they have to decide what to do. And eventually, they... Um, you know, 
being hum humane, <laughs> they uh, they decide to uh, raise her as one of them, even though she looks different and she looks ugly, you know, to them. And so, so, and so then, as you, you as an adult or a young young woman, do you, what what do you go through? It's like Jungle it? Book, you know. It's, <laughs> it's not like Jungle Book. No. But what what do you get? Do you go through? Uh, I mean, do you is there a sort of uh, are you fought over by the clan? Do you have well, romance? Do you? Oh well, basically, she's thought of as really ugly and um, very. Uh, she's an taller, and she's you know. She's skinny, and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't, she's not good for a lot of the same things, you know, she's not as strong in, in certain ways, but she's stronger in others, and it doesn't, she just doesn't quite match up, and she's, she's definitely an outcast, you know, they think that she'll never have a mate, you know, because none of the guys like her, you know, <laughs> and, um, a very today's story. Yeah, and and, and the, her mother, so to speak, uh, the medicine woman, uh, decides to give her teacher a, a career you know give her give her medicine so at least she knows something so she'll be useful you know because if she can't have a husband she can have a career <laughs> and um, so she learns medicine and she becomes useful in that way because she becomes the second medicine woman mm. and uh, um, then there's this the son of the leader who is about the same age maybe a couple years older who's basically always resented her because he sees her He's, he's one of the smarter uh, of um, the clan members, and some of the, the clan members who are a little bit smarter do see her as, a, as a, uh, um, a threat because, not as a threat to them, but as a threat to their race. They sort of recognize that she's more advanced. She is more intelligent. It's, it's not because, you know, she's this, you know, member of this Aryan race or anything, it's just that she's more evolved, you know, she's not a crow, she's a crow magnet, she's not a Neanderthal, and so she's more intelligent, she's got more stamina and endurance, she's uh, uh, stronger and, you know, with some of her muscles, and, and uh, <clears throat> she has the, the power to think in the future, where they only have the power to remember and think in the past, and they can only count to three, and, you know, there's all these things, right? Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, he sees her as a threat and basically has always resented the fact that they took her in, you know, and he, every time the clan has bad luck, he blames it on her in his mind, and, and uh, uh, like, well, he's getting his manhood ceremony, and at the same time as he receives his manhood ceremony, which is the biggest day of, of a boy's life, it's like, it's the greatest thing, the same day he's getting that, they also decide to, to accept her as a member of the clan, finally. That's the same day, so it just infuriates him because after he's basking in the, the glow of his manhood ceremony, she takes the light away because everyone is stunned that, you know, they're accepting her, and it it's creates so much, like, whispering and excitement and stuff that it takes all of the attention away from him, and, it, you know, it just, you know, right. infuriates him. So eventually he ends up... Uh, having a run-in with her, you know, I'm telling you the whole story practically, but... No, don't, don't tell me the whole story. You know, but, he, I mean, he, it there, there's the... a contrast with them, and really, that there is no, uh, no love story in the first book. Um, she doesn't, she never, she never uh, has any kind of romantic, uh, nothing happens really, you know, um, although... What do, what do you wear in the, uh, through the film? I mean, how advanced are you in terms of dress? Oh, so. Norma Kamali. Uh, Sorry? <laughs> I was Norma Kamali. No, um, just a plain, you know, like leather sack. I don't know. So it's, it's just it, like what you would do. You, you know, skin an animal and right. you take one skin and, you know, they crudely lace it, you know, or tie it right. or, you know, to another one. And that's it, you know. Do you wear things on your feet? Uh, yeah, in the winter they do, not all year round, but in the winter, um, and when they're going on long treks, they just wrap a bunch of leather around their feet, it doesn't even look, it doesn't look like anything, it's just like, sort of wrapped up stuff, you know, and really that's what we had, there was no soles in them or anything, and, you know. Uh, quite, quite amazing, the story, the making of the film, everything about it. Tell me, the, 
the um, did you agree to do the film before Splash came out and, and was the box office success? Uh, yeah, I think right around the same time. Yeah. So would, would you uh, had it been long, say six months had passed after the success of Splash, would you have still done the film? Do you think? Yeah, probably. I think I, I you know, I, now I mean. You know, every time you do a film, you learn a little bit more of what you want to not do again or what you want to make sure to do next time. And I think that now I would make sure that the script is exactly the way I want it before I go into another movie. Because, you know, it just is too strenuous <laughs> for everybody if you're, if everyone has to, uh, you know, fight and, or, or, or even, or even just try to get it there while you're making the film it's too much of a rush it's too much of a panic and and I think you you have to make sure that it's really what you want it to be before you yeah. go into it and that's that's one thing I've really learned you know that, that I'm going to make sure of from now on and after that film you haven't you haven't done anything yet uh, since then no I haven't but you told me that you're going to do <laughs> yes you're doing a comedy is it the yeah I am uh, it, um, at the moment, it's called Knights of the Realm. That's right. Yeah. It's a Paramount, yeah, with Rupert Everett. Everett. Yeah, and it's, I just read the first 40 pages, uh, the, the rewrite, yesterday, and it's so good. Really good. I mean, I laughed out loud on every single page. <laughs> I was, And I never do that, you know. I never laugh out loud when I'm reading a script. I was thrilled. And so hopefully, you know, that thing's going to fall together. And that'll in the be next shot in England, too. Uh, England, yeah. yeah. Hopefully that'll fall together in the next m month or two, you know, and I think that maybe if all goes well, we could be shooting it in August or September. Yeah. I mean, I've never noticed uh, your, your finger. You had an accident, I guess. When I was about three. Cutting up mum's uh, no, meat yeah. or something out the back. No, my grandmother had a one of those things that helps old ladies up the side of the stairs, you know, the oh, chair, yeah. and I was used to, we used to hold onto the wire as a kid, you know, so I just got caught in the pulley, and when you're three, your hands are so little that, yeah. you know, you step on it and smash them. And did it sever it, or did I just have to cut it off? I really, you know, I, do, I just remember. don't remember, but, but I think, you know, nowadays they have all these things, you know, the finger surgeons and plastic yeah, surgeons, yeah. and in those days they just, you know, figured, you know, it's smushed here, we'll just clean that up, you know, you'll never notice. Does, does it worry you at all? No. Do you make a point when you're shooting to sort of, when some people have their, uh, prefer their right profile, profile no, I don't you don't really worry about that? No. But it, I mean, I know, I mean, I've seen, I've seen, what was it, Summer Vacation, was it? Summer Lovers. Summer Lovers. Um, I think, I, see, I think I've seen all the films you've done. I've never noticed it. Yeah, I've gone through, you know, my entire school year without my best friends even noticing. It's just because, you know, I don't know, people don't look very closely, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. You know? yeah. Probably when I, when I was a little kid, I used to be real self-conscious and always I just sit like this, you know, and stuff. And so probably because of habit, I, you know, I, I probably, you know, position it in certain ways that people don't notice, you know, like I'll sit like this or, right. you know, I don't know, <laughs> but it's not very conscious anymore. No, no, I guess you get over those sort of things. Listen, uh, is there anything else at all about the movie that we should perhaps cover at all in any respect? Well, um, actually, you know, I, I still am, I'm still uh, holding a lot of hope for it that it turns out good. Uh, poster's great, I just saw <laughs> a teaser, you know, poster that they're going to use, which is fabulous. Um, and they've also, they're also doing the right thing as far as the music goes right now, I think. Who's doing the music for it? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I will. Jackson. Yeah. Anyway, no, uh, Herbie Hancock, I think, uh -huh. is doing it. And I, I really think that's going to be great. And, um, that, you know, I think they're, they're taking their time, which is great, because they wanted to release it this summer. And, and uh, whenever they say, look, we want to make this right and, you know, we're going to, um, we're not going to release it until it's ready, then, then you're in luck, you know, so, and that's what they're doing. So they're going to wait till the fall to release it now and they're going to, they're going to do it right. And so I'm really holding a lot of hope for it. I'm going to go have a meeting with them again tomorrow about what's happening with the editing and how they're going to, you know, translate it, if they're going to use narration or subtitles or what, you know. And that hasn't been clarified yet. No, they're working on that still. They're trying all different ways, you know. Daryl is 62 now and married to singer-songwriter Neil Young since 2018. 
While she still works as an actress, Dowell devotes much of her time to environmental causes, including working with the UN and other international organisations. Her latest films are Buckle Up and she returns as L Driver for Kill Bill Volume 3 in 2023.